Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Collider Mailbag, the all mailbag show here on Collider Video, where all we do is take your mailbag questions, much more laid back, relaxed kind of thing. I am one of your hosts today, the host of Movie Talk. My name is John Campion, and your other host today, host of TV Talk, Mr. <laughs> Josh McCuga. What's up, John? How are you, bud? I'm doing really good. Great, and man. We just had a great week we of uh, daily TV talks. I, it was a blast, man. Uh, I, I got to tell you, the fans, we got a lot of people watching live, a lot of views, very consistent. Everybody was really awesome. Uh, you know, we got... The beautiful thing about the Daily TV Talk, as we talked before, got to talk about a ton of actual television, not just TV news. Yeah. The day after the show, it was a blast. Everybody, you know, Jason Inman, Emma Fife, David Griffin, John Roca, Sinead DeFries, everybody killed it. It was great. Yeah, you guys yeah. have done a great job. Thanks, and man. Hopefully you guys had a chance to check that out and give us some of your feedback about that. But now we are doing mailbag. Look, guys, this is a much more laid back, relaxed kind of show here on Collider Video. And how do you get a mailbag question to us? It's simple. Make sure you're following us. Uh, first of all, on Twitter and Facebook and everything at Collider Video, but also send us an email simply to collidervideo at gmail.com. Send on in your questions. We take a bunch of your mailbag questions here on the weekends. We also take some questions Monday through Friday on Movie Talk and fire me off some questions on my Facebook, Twitter, whatever. We take questions from all over the place. So without any further ado, let's get into it. And our first question today comes to us from Carl Cotgrave, who writes, Hi, Collider crew from the UK. I hope you're all doing well. My question is, with the Dark Tower movie coming out in a few months, as well as it, is there a Stephen King movie verse in play? One actor in particular, Nicholas Hamilton, who will play Henry Bowers in it, will also play the character Lucas Hansen in the Dark Tower. Your thoughts? Didn't you just kind of answer your own question? <laughs> I mean, you got an act, one actor who's in both of those movies playing completely different, different characters. Char if he was playing uh, Henry Bowers in both movies, then sure. I, I, you're not going to see Chris Pratt play Star Lord and then go to Thor and play Thor. You know what I mean? Right. Like he's, or play he, a guy named Eddie Sminx. <laughs> right? I thought that was Star Lord. Nope. Eddie nope. Sminx. Eddie Sminx. I'm a radar technician. I don't know. I'm just making things up now as I go. Right, so, um, oh, no, Lord. I don't think any sort of a Stephen King uh, multi or like a universe, shared universe. I mean, Stephen sure. King has never done that except for within individual series and stuff like that the idea is cool you know sure, because yeah. because you know steven spielberg's uh, steven spielberg man we are starting <laughs> off hot here today john uh stephen king's books all take place in maine or in like some sort of that new england area yep. whether it's massachusetts new hampshire vermont maine um so having a cool stephen U, uh, king multiverse would be awesome yeah but i i you know as of right now I, I wouldn't imagine no i just don't see them doing that right now with this particular group of characters that like you again you just mentioned the one actor is playing different characters so there goes the universe and crazy enough uh i just looked up stephen king's it uh, eddie minsk in the, in the movie really no. <laughs> let's be confused with uh eddie sminks sure why not all right let's move oh. on to the next question and the next question uh goes to television okay Mark Scheisser writes, I really like the TV show Constantine. Too bad it was canceled. And I'm a great fan of Lucifer. Why not do What Happened in Arrow and let Constantine have an appearance? Wouldn't it be interesting to see how Constantine deals with this incarnation of the Lord of Hell? I can't remember. Do you watch uh, Lucifer? Uh, I do not watch Lucifer. I know you do. I you're, love yeah, that you're show. You're a huge fan. Huge um, show. Whenever huge anybody fan. asks me on, on uh, TV talk about Lucifer, I always go, Tweet John Campia. See what he thinks. Facebook him. Um, I, I, Actually, no. John's and I, Jeremy and I, both are like okay. massive fans of that show. Yeah, and you know what? I've heard a lot of great things about it. And it's one of those, it's like on that five list of TV shows. It's in my queue of like, I got to start watching the show. I got it's a, you know, that, Gotham, Sense8. I mean, there's The Expanse, shows that uh, tons of people love, especially our fans, and they talk about, but I don't watch Lucifer. However, last year on Arrow, I thought Constantine was the highest of the highlights of that season. Yeah, that was a sure. really neat appearance. Agreed. And, and it made sense. And it is, you know what? I, I'm i not sorry Constantine got canceled, to be honest with you. I, okay. The pilot. Awesome. I really like the pilot. And then it's not just that the show went downhill. You watch the second episode, they completely changed the show. Mm -hmm. It's like all these things they set up with certain characters and all, like what it felt like the tone of the show was going to be. It's like they did this great pilot and then some executive somewhere said, I, okay, the show can continue, but but I don't like what you're doing. Change it. And it was like a totally different show after the pilot. It's, what's weird about that too is a lot of the writers and, and producers and such on the pilot moved yes. after it. Yeah. So you had 
you really had a whole new creative team behind it that watched the pilot, weren't as big of fans as the people that brought in the pilot yeah. because of contracts and whatnot, and that's why the show changed. And you're right, it, it did not succeed where where and when it was. If you brought Constantine back now into like a mini sewed kind of situation at the CW, maybe six to eight episodes, and put him in that Arrow uh, Flash universe, right. I think it could really work. You know, They could do something, because you're right, I was surprised when he popped up in Arrow how well he fit into that universe. Mm-hmm. In contrast, though, to Lucifer, to Lucifer, it doesn't fit at all. Okay. The imagery and the picture of hell and the demonic and all that kind of stuff in Constantine is totally and radically different from the way it's all portrayed and set up in Lucifer. The two, they're just too contrasting. They're just too completely opposite of each other. They contradict one another. So while on paper you think Constantine meets Lucifer, mm-hmm. da 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 da, <laughs> like sure, why not? But really, when you look at how the shows are structured, they're they're just they're contradictory to one another. So I don't think you can put them together. Yeah, I think there might actually be some. Uh, um you know, network kind of ownership rights kind of a thing. As oh, well there absolutely would be. Yeah. But I mean, even those aside, you couldn't yeah. put them together because they just contradict one Agreed. another. Okay. All right. We move on now to the next question, which comes to us from Austin Dune, who writes, John Roca has mentioned that because he has served in the military, and thank you for your service, Mr. Roca, that it affects him sometimes when watching a war movie. Exa- ex- for example, that's not how it was, or that's not the proper way of holding a firearm in battle. Do any of you have past work or life experiences that when you see something in a movie that relates to that event, it immediately affects your overall enjoyment of the film? This is one of the most fun questions we've ever been asked because I always point out things that I hate. Okay, like, like, like this isn't right. That's not right. Okay, here's a number one. In the movie, The Italian Job, okay, they ride those Mini Coopers over yes. that dam. That's out at Hanson Dam, which is about 20 25 minutes drive from us here. Where really? We are now. Didn't know that. 10 minutes, five minutes later, they're on Hollywood Boulevard. And I'm like, God, they're going to hit traffic on the 170, definitely on the 101. Uh, it's going to take them at least 45 minutes to get there. They're not in traffic. Yes, that's one of But I, I can go on. What, go ahead, you. For me, it was always okay, look, So I've, you guys know my past lives here. I've worked as a visual effects guy mm-hmm. and, and things like that. Worked Always worked with in the realm of computers, right? Mm-hmm. What would always drive me crazy would be when like, and I'm sure this drives people who didn't, don't even have backgrounds in computer technology or anything like that. It's like when they go, okay, um, let me take a look at the the picture of this. And some guy goes and types on his computer. It's like, that doesn't bring up a picture. No, yes. yes. And or when they go, when they take, okay, they get up, there was a picture taken from a, a, a bad little pin camera from 500 yards away. Enhance, and then it just has somebody typing on a keyboard, and all of a sudden this blurry picture gets like that doesn't happen. <laughs> that is not how that works. That doesn't happen. Uh, so just things like that, especially when it comes to you know realm of love was that? people driving in cars going like this. Oh it's yes, not, you can't drive a the car. Ca- the car like is that. going straight. But I remember once, damn it, I think oh, I think it might have been a Will Smith movie. It might have been a- another actor. I can't remember off the top of my head. But I remember there's this one movie where it's like pull up some satellite imagery, and it's literally of these guys, and he shows them from from like a satellite point of view. But then when you cut to the camera of those guys standing there, they're like in a garage. <laughs> And it's like, I, I don't care what kind of satellite that is. You can't, you can't see, see these through. guys. When Mark and I did the, the CIA training uh, uh, with Warner Brothers. I'm for, so envious of that. No, that was that so, much so much fun. Um, they, they were like, let me show you how to hold a gun. They were like, when you watch people holding guns and they're going like this, like you got to hold it up here and certain aspects of it and where you're pointing it and whatnot. And they said, whatever you do. If you are ever shooting a handgun, there is no possible way accuracy can be used when you point it sideways. Hold a gun like this, not like this. Those The military guys always have the funniest things because they're like, oh, his haircut's wrong, his outfit's wrong, his salute is off. They always pick out the good stuff. Uh, Jason Inman, too, always picks out that kind of stuff. It's oh, for sure. Jason yes. Inman would pick that stuff yeah. out. You know, it's always funny. It reminds me, when you're talking about holding the gun sideways, yeah. it reminds me of, oh, um... A date night with yeah. Steve Carantina Fay, and when the guy holds his gun, he's holding it sideways. It's the kill shot. It's the kill shot. He's holding it sideways. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question comes to us from Gil Martin Paris, who writes, "Greetings, Collider. Uh, love all your videos, even while I'm at work. I, it's it, you. Okay, first of all, this goes back." Along, all the way back to the original movie blog, the audio edition podcast we used to do. How many people would write us to say they either listen to our podcast or watch our shows? 
at work. Uh, we cannot be responsible for any termination in your current job or career. <laughs> but yes, I, that's my favorite stuff. I'm at work. <laughs> I'm like, guys, don't get fired. <laughs> All right. My question is, do you think they will bring Eddie Murphy as Mushu in the Mulan live action movie? Thanks. And may the force be with you. May the fourth be with you. Yeah, may the fourth be with you. We were actually recording this on uh, on May the fourth, uh, which was Thursday, of course. What do you think? Any chance of Eddie Murphy popping up? Well, I thought they talked. You know, when we were doing Film HQ back in the day, they talked about bringing in all Asian cast for this. So yes, I, they did. I would doubt that they would bring in Eddie Murphy. You don't think Eddie would fit in? I don't think so. Okay, look. First of all, no, <laughs> no. Were you look, throwing me? What? Were you, were you, uh, yes, I was. Yes, a little okay. Bit. Okay. So look. Mushu, like Eddie Murphy's character in the animated film, was was delightful. Sure. I really liked what he brought to that character. It was a little bit of as a ripoff of his own donkey and Shrek. Sure, mm-hmm. it was a little bit, but mm-hmm. who cares? It fit the movie and it worked and it played in well and it bounced off the other stuff going on. However, they've already said that their approach to this Mulan is going to be very different than that animated movie. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a war film. It's going to be a little... I mean, it's not going to be an R-rated film, but it's going to skew a little bit more adult. adult. They're not going to have a dragon talking talk <laughs> the way like what Eddie Murphy so brilliantly brought to the animated version. That animated character, while fit perfectly in that movie, would not fit in the picture they're painting for what they're going to make this Mulan. So yeah. does... Do they have a scene where Eddie Murphy does a brief cameo or something like that standing in the background? Sure, maybe that would be fun, mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. But for them to actually bring that animated character into a completely different tone of a movie, it just wouldn't make sense. You, do you see any way they can make no, that work? No, not at all. I, like you said, this is they are going to be as accurate to the Mulan tale and, and where everything it, Eddie Murphy just doesn't fit into it. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the next question. The next question comes to us from Tobias Harris Husick, who writes, Would Robert Zemeckis be a good choice for directing the Flash movie? You know, this came from a rumor that was uh, floated around. I believe the rumor's been debunked now, but there was a rumor going around earlier this week that uh, Robert Zemeckis might have been in talks or talking about maybe directing the Flash movie. And a lot of us, when we heard that, were like, huh? <laughs> like, what? Like, I don't get me wrong. I love me some Robert Zemeckis. Sure, but sure. that just doesn't seem like a fit. And honestly, whether it was still a rumor or whether it was debunked is kind of relative. That's still kind of where I'm at. Robert Zemeckis is a, is a wonderful filmmaker, wonderful storyteller. I don't see that as a fit. At all, you know, I think Peter Jackson is a tremendous storyteller, tremendous director, but I don't see him as a fit for a Star Wars film. Yeah. Um. So I, I, I just don't see the fit there myself. What about you? I feel like at this point with the Flash movie, there it's like you're at a deli counter and like like seventy, <laughs> deli seventy two. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess I'll put my hand here at the Flash one. I, I don't know. I think Robert Zemeckis. You, you need some fresh blood in this this mm. Flash franchise, and you need somebody that is a fan. I think somebody somebody like Robert Zemeckis has had his hands in a lot of amazing movies. I just don't see the Flash movie, and, and I can't put my finger on why, other than it just doesn't seem like his kind of project. Right. You know, like, maybe 25 years ago, Robert Zemeckis is the <laughs> name that you hire. But right now, it kind of seems like he's doing a lot of passion projects and the the kind of fan fervor and pressure that would come along with the Flash film, he doesn't see that as something that he should care about. Okay, now, if you were to pitch to me, like, I, I don't think it's a good fit, not because of talent, I just don't think it's a fit. If you were to pitch to me, okay, so there's this scene, right? Where, where Barry starts running and he starts traveling through time and then he passes Doc and Marty and comes across <laughs> them. It's like, okay, want to talk about shared universes? All Definitely. right, sure. Let's yes. see. He starts racing. Barry starts disappearing from pictures or whatever. Then fine, I can see that okay. happening. But otherwise, no, I don't I'm see that as you. a good fit. With you. All right, next question comes to us from Zach Burkle who writes, ZB. Should Deathstroke still be the villain in the Batman? Would the character fit better in Nightwing movie, in a Nightwing movie, or a Batgirl movie? Um, I have a feeling that Deathstroke isn't going to be the uh, the character, the villain in, in the Batman movie anymore. I, I think when the new director came on, look, we start first of all, we heard um, uh, how do we pronounce the actor's name again? Do what did we land on? Uh, Who are we talking about? Uh, it was Megan Manganello. Oh, Joe Manganello. Man, a lot of people say Manganiello. Manganiello. Uh, Manganiello, you know, was saying, "Yeah, I'm Deathstroke." Yeah. And it's like, "Oh, we're going to be shooting Deathstroke. We're going to be shooting soon." To, 
um, as far as I know, I'm still Deathstroke, mm-hmm. to I think I'm still Deathstroke, <laughs> to now he's not saying anything. Right. I have a feeling that uh, whatever incarnation there was of the Batman script before all the upheaval and everything, I think that I got a feeling that that's gone. Yeah. I have either a sneaking suspicion right now at this point that whatever script was there is gone, and I don't think Deathstroke is a villain anymore. What, and I actually thought, I was one of the guys, who I thought that Deathstroke was a great choice for a villain for a Batman 100% movie. 100% agree. He's a dude that can be a physical confrontation, a physical threat to Batman. When in a lot of the Batman movies, the arch nemesis aren't, or nemesis, nemesis. I, nemesis. I feel like Captain Amazing nemesis. having that conversation with uh, Casanova Frankenstein. And <laughs> like, is it nemesis? Is it nemesis? Anyway, <laughs> nemesis? Anyway, um, with the multiple villains in the Batman, we're often given villains that are not physical threats. To Batman, and it's kind of cool. Bane being an exception, obviously, it's kind of cool to come across uh, the idea of a Deathstroke because he's incredibly intelligent, like Batman. He's incredibly physically gifted, like Batman. I mean, there's there's a lot there that makes him a really great foil. Would he be a better fit for like a Nightwing movie or a Batgirl movie? It really doesn't matter because 95% of the movie going audience has no idea who Deathstroke is. 95% of the movie going audience doesn't associate Deathstroke with Nightwing. They don't associate Deathstroke with, with, with the Teen Titans or with Batgirl or whoever. And really when it comes down to it, it doesn't matter what character you pick. It all is about how do the filmmakers and the screenwriters treat the character. Because you could have Deathstroke be a terrific villain for Superman if you wanted to, if you wrote him right and had him fit that role right um, from a creative point of view. So it really doesn't matter. I would have loved to have seen him as a Batman villain. I just have a feeling... And I, by the way, I'm not basing that on anything. He very well could still be the villain for Batman. I just have a feeling at this point he's not. So... so I, I, Joe's from Pittsburgh. Everybody knows I talk about Pittsburgh all the time. I wear all of Pittsburgh. I know his brother Nick really well. Um, really, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. He was he's actually my, my brother's age in high school, and there was so much fervor and so much attention thrown at Joe when he got that death stroke. When those death stroke images came out, Everybody I was, was I was per, I was one of them. I yeah. was one of the guys totally psyched, very yeah. excited about and, that. You know, he's a, he's a good actor. He is absolutely jacked and. I think in that role, everybody's like, yes, that makes total sense as Deathstroke. I don't think anybody was not on board with him being the villain. I think everybody else was more worried about what is this movie going to be about yeah. than it was the villain. And I would love to see him back as the villain. And I would love to see Deathstroke because, because you and I are in pretty much agreement. The best villain in the history of Arrow has been Deathstroke. Oh, yeah, for sure. Without in a doubt. Arrow, yeah. Without a doubt. With, uh, with our buddy Manu Bennett Manu playing Bennett. the role. He did such a great job in yeah. that. Unfortunately, the television universe and the movie universe are two totally different things. So mm-hmm. they couldn't go out and get Manu. Right. to go Because I think Manu would have been a great... On the big screen, Deathstroke as well. But, you know, that's not going to happen. All right, let's move on. The next question today comes to us from Dalton Ham, who writes, What are the odds... You're thinking Roadhouse, aren't you? I am. (laughs) (laughs) I knew it. As soon as I said Dalton, you giggled. I knew you were thinking Roadhouse. Okay, odds of a Portal movie ever getting made. Okay, Portal is one of these games, if you haven't played, the gameplay... I've never played. Really? You've never played? Gameplay, it's a fun game. It's a fun game gameplay-wise. In my opinion, what makes that game really special isn't the gameplay, which is fun. It's that it's hilarious. The script and the dialogue, especially from the the computer system and the, the AI... And it is so funny. There will be cake. Um, <laughs> I I just, I love that game. I just like playing getting to the next level just so I could hear the dialogue <laughs> in the next level. That's why I play it. Now, listen, a while ago, I believe it was J.J. Abrams. Um, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was J.J. Abrams. Like three or four years ago, they made an announcement that J.J. Abrams made uh, entered into a, a deal with the company behind Portal and another game or two to develop stuff for the Portal property. And a lot of us got really excited about that because a Portal game, because, like I said, the real specialness of that game isn't the gameplay, it's the hilarity of it. And But again... The script kind of writes itself kind of a Yeah, thing. not taking anything away from how fun the gameplay is. I'm just okay. saying, the thing I walk away from really remembering is how, how funny and entertaining the game was. They made a deal to develop some stuff, but that was years ago. And I have heard nothing about it since. You know, apparently you haven't heard anything no, about it. I have no. I mean, this is the first I'm hearing and of you describing this game. Listen, I'm not. I, everybody, knows, I'm not a gamer. Uh, I, I probably stopped around Nintendo 64, and 
I, but the way you describe this game, th and we've we talk about it all the time. There hasn't been very many, if if any, game to movie. By very many, you mean any? You, right. <laughs> like okay, the Mortal Kombat movie. It the was, original is stupid as hell. It's great. I love it, but it is stupid it's, as hell. It's not. Yeah. So if you're describing this movie as some or this game as something that could be made into a movie that you would enjoy based on a script. It's not the gameplay. It's the script. How has this not been made? I know. I, it's honestly, it's, especially considering that there was a deal made, there was progress being made, and since then I've heard nothing about it. So Weird. maybe I'm forgetting about a story that came out two years ago about how the deal was scrapped or what. I, I, I don't know. But like yeah. I said, jump. if you guys know anything more about that particular deal, and maybe it wasn't even J.J. Abrams, maybe it was... J Joss Whedon, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure it was J.J. Abrams. Jump into the comment section and let us know if you guys know anything more about that. That would be great. All right. Next question comes to us from Ricardo Salazar, who writes, Do you think we will see Boba Fett in the Han Solo movie? Yes. Yeah, uh, I'm. I as much as I don't want him to pop up in there, I think it's pretty much a 100% guarantee. I, yeah. I will be shocked. I will be really surprised if he's not in there. Yeah, I, I mean, unless this is so far of a prequel... Then we're to see Jango Fett. Uh, would it be in that timeline? It no 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 no, 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 right? no, 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 no. Jango Fett would have been dead a long time. Don dead. Okay, so yeah, then yes, I would. A, a young Boba Fett. Not that you can ever see his age because he's always going to have the mask. Unless he one takes would it off. hope he would always have the mask. Yeah. Look, if Dread knows to keep the mask yes. on Carl Urban, <laughs> I would hope they know to keep the Mandalorian helmet on Boba Fett the entire movie. One hundred percent. I mean, but the, I, you would imagine this would probably be one of his main villains, one of his main foes in the Han Solo. They make a trilogy. You could. I mean, we haven't heard anything about that. So, right. but so will he be a main character in this movie? No. Will he pop up? I'll be shocked if they don't do it. Like yeah. I said, I don't like it when they shrink the universe. Okay. And, and having Boba Fett pop up is once again, just shrinking the universe. I hope they don't, but I don't think they're going to be able to resist. I, agree. I don't think they'll be able to stop themselves. All right. Let's hope he does that dance number that he did in the Christmas. Oh, special. Come on. Sorry. Boba. <laughs> All right. Tobias Harris Husick writes, uh, now that you've seen King Arthur, are you more or less excited for Guy Ritchie's Aladdin? You know, it's funny because a couple days ago, somebody asked that very question um, uh, during the Twitter segment on Movie Talk. So Guy Ritchie has directed the, uh, the King Arthur movie. I have seen the King Arthur movie. We are not allowed to review the movie yet. We're still under embar really? embargo. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. But we were allowed to tweet out a quick social media reaction. Okay. So I will tell you what I tweeted on my social media reaction, which was simply this. Uh, saw, I think I've word for word said this. Saw uh, King Arthur. Know what? I really liked it. Um, so there, I, I can say that that's what was in my tweet. I really liked the movie. Surprising, because uh, you know a lot of the trailers didn't blow anybody well, away. Well, here's the thing. Yes, I, I was just gonna say the trailers didn't per se blow anybody away or blow me away, but they also didn't make me go. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, oh my goodness, this movie is gonna be terrible. It's King Arthur doing Ninja Jacks. You know, it was it was actually a pretty accurate representation of what I thought the King Arthur trailer would look like. Right, and you know, coming out of it, so I saw it. It was me. Um, uh, Perry was there, although I have not had a chance to talk to Perry about it. Okay. Uh, Jeremy, I Mark, talked to, I talked to Ellis, about Mark, it. and Christian, and we all liked it. Okay, it was, which uh, again, we all walked out going, "Wow, that was surprising." So, what does that do? I look, I was already completely on board. I thought, look, I never would have picked Guy Ritchie's name out of a hat for Aladdin, and I'm a huge Guy Ritchie fan. Mm -hmm. Snatch. One of my all-time favorite movies. Amazing. That movie is so good. Lock, so, stock, I was and two say, Lock, Stock Barrels. Lock, Stock is incredible. Yeah. Um, Rock and Rolla, yeah. things like that. I really liked his his take on the first uh, Sherlock Holmes movie. Maybe not so much the second one. I am a big Guy Ritchie fan. And so I was very intrigued by his addition to the Aladdin thing. Here's what I'll say. Seeing that he was able to take a mythology like King Arthur make it a distinctly Guy Ritchie movie while not letting his Guy Ritchie-isms completely dominate the movie and still let the, its own mythology breathe and live and grow and have a life, if he can bring that same sensibility to Aladdin, I think watching King Arthur has increased my excitement really? for, for him doing it. Look, one of the things that Christian Harloff brought up, actually, no, I think it was Jeremy Johns, 
brought up on a movie talk the other day. So much of Aladdin, whether or not Aladdin will work, is not even who they cast as the genie. It's how they deal with the genie in general. Mm -hmm. Like, what is going to be their incarnation and their vision of the genie? Is it a blue painted man? Yeah. Is it, is it, is it a CG character? If it, it... if it is CG, like, what's the design like? Mm -hmm. What's Is it going to be a Robin Williams type personality? Are they going to go with a totally different type of personality? I mean, I, I don't know. And I'm not going to get too excited or be condemning about whatever they announce it's going to be. But it's just going to be how does it play out? That's what's going to make that movie work or not. And so Guy Ritchie has his hands full. This is... Okay, I'm, I'm looking at, at, at Guy Ritchie's uh, IMDb profile here, director-wise. I loved Revolver. I thought that was actually a really well-done movie. Not, yeah, I like not, Revolver a lot. Uh, Snatch. I, I saw Snatch, and then my buddy was like, you have to see Lockstock. So I saw that right after, because yep. Lockstock is incredible. I haven't seen King Arthur. I'm, I'm not in your in your crew. But Man from Uncle may be the I, most underrated film of 2015. Yes. That's, I loved Man from Uncle. And that movie was so un-Guy Ritchie-like. Yeah. Which makes me, because before that, you know, you have the, the quick shots, the slow-mo, the punches like in Sherlock. Those are very stylized. Man from Uncle, not crazy stylized. No. Nope. Really well written, really well acted, and an unbelievable ending to that movie. Now, yes, I know it's a remake, but if you go and watch the original Man from Uncle, I made my dad watch the new Man from Uncle. He's like, this is a completely different movie. Guy Ritchie knocked that out of the park. That's what gets me excited for something like Aladdin because a new twist on Aladdin, make it, give it that stylized, give it the script that's a little smarter because yep. Aladdin, as far as a Disney movie, is more of just like a goofballish tale of a prince, of a pauper turned to prince. It really is. Yeah. And if you're going to make, because I know I'm in, in a, a very small minority when I say that I thought that Beauty and the Beast was, it was fine. Right? It was, it was fine. I mean, it was basically the same thing. It, I didn't see a lot of... Um, there wasn't a lot of chemistry between Emma Watson and the Beast. I think with with Aladdin, you have to get that chemistry between Aladdin and the Genie oh, before you get totally. the chemistry between Aladdin. And, and almost Jasmine. as important, you really have to, you really do have to nail that 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 uh, chemistry between Aladdin and Jasmine as well. But yeah. you're right that what that makes the movie is the chemistry between Aladdin and the Genie, and so much of that was Robin Williams. And look, you can all be forgiven, and we can be forgiven. That when we think of the genie, we think of Robin Williams. 100. The mythology of the genie and Aladdin goes way back before Robin Williams ever oh, voiced well, the yeah, role. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I think we can all forgive ourselves if we instantly think Robin Williams, and it's going to be really neat to see how they navigate that. I, w I, I would say of the Disney live actions that they're obviously how they're going to do uh, Little Mermaid still intrigues me, just like um, intrigues me how they're going to do Aquaman, but. Uh, Aladdin on the a totally other end of the spectrum intrigues me simply because Guy Ritchie's name's attached to it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Last question of the day. And this one comes to us from Dan Pluck, who writes, After 15 films now out in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, what would you say are your top three? Wait, say that again? <sighs> now that there are 15 movies out in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, mm -hmm. what would we say are our top three favorite Marvel Cinematic Universe films? This is, this is tough. Okay, so... Let, let me talk contenders first before I just give the top three. So contenders would have to be Avengers, mm -hmm. Captain America Civil War, Captain America Winter Soldier, mm -hmm. um, to me the first Thor movie, mm -hmm. the first Guardians. Uh, Ant-Man was really damn Dude, good. That's, okay. I, okay, what would you put in your top okay, three? Uh, three is definitely the first Avengers. Okay. Two is... Two is Civil War, and one is Ant Man. I oh, really love Ant -Man. I love Ant Man too. I do. There's something really special about a standalone movie that really took me outside of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but also kept me in it. Yeah. Oh, that's that was very profound. Yeah, thanks. I like that a lot. <laughs> um, okay, for me, my number one because it is my I still think is the best all time comic book movie ever made is the first Avengers movie. Getting into number two, I guess I would have to go Civil War. And three, I'm going to say th the first Thor movie. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that Kenneth Branagh first Thor movie. It's really, really good. It's it's so good because really at the heart of that movie, it's not a big superpowered beings battling each other. No, it's a story about a father and his two sons. That's it's it's a family story, mm -hmm. and the 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 drama and the conflict within that, and that's the one where Loki became that. The reason why Loki people love Loki so much is because he's got funny quippy dialogue. He does. <laughs> he Loki has great dialogue, yeah. 
But it's the fact that he's such a layered villain. He's a dude who all he ever wanted was the approval and love of his father. And the real tragedy of it is he didn't realize he had it already. He's Scar. Uh, yeah, in many ways. He's Scar in many ways. And the, and the the great thing, too, is when you get to the end of Thor, I thought this was brilliant. As you're getting towards the end of Thor, you're thinking Loki's going to assassinate Odin. Mm -hmm. But then you find out, no, he just wanted to be a hero in his dad's eyes. He was never going to let anybody touch his father. So Laufey comes in, or he kills his dad, he goes, wrong, and he turns and he kills the frost giants and yep. all that kind of stuff. It's like that type of layering of a villain character is what makes really special villains. And I think that's why that stands out to me. And then the final fight when Loki and Thor start fighting each other, the dialogue between them, I think is very special. I, I just, like I said, what Brana brought to that movie, I thought was great. Brana is an incredible director, uh, mostly because he comes from such a strong Shakespearean background. And he brings that Shakespearean feel 100%. to those films. I, you know, for me, a close close fourth place in there is definitely the Guardians, the first Guardians film. I haven't Love seen, the first I Guardians film. I haven't seen film. two yet. But for me, as, as you're talking about Thor, the one thing that always got me out of the Thor universe was I, I was never a fan of Natalie Portman in that role. And I, think, I will agree with you. And I think that's why it kind of took me out of a little bit of the Thorverse. And I think one of the more underrated films in the MCU, and people always put it at the end because it doesn't star a person currently still in the MCU, is The Incredible Hulk with Edward oh, Norton. Yeah. No, I, I liked I, that movie. Yeah. yeah. I'm in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> I, I no, actually, I really like that movie too. Great villain. Mm -hmm. And you know, remember, Abomination is still out there. Oh, yeah. They did not kill Abomination. He's still out there. Actually, a lot of people think that prison that they were holding half of the Avengers in in Civil War, mm -hmm. in the middle of the ocean, I believe that is the prison they're also supposed to be holding uh, Abomination in. Interesting. So, I mean, I've always wanted to see them bring Abomination back. Yeah. And and, and Tim, uh, Roth. Tim Roth, who who played, I mean, uh, what was the character's name? Bansky or something like that? I can't oh, remember man. what the character's name was. Not important. <laughs> That's it. That'll do it for us, guys. We're all out of time for today. Thanks for joining us for this installment of Mailbag. I, of course, want to thank Mr. Josh McCuga. Josh, where can people find you? Hey, at Josh McCuga on Twitter and Instagram. We're back. TV Talk on Monday. We're doing it weekly for a little bit while we discuss here our plans for the future of the show, but we had a blast doing... Uh, daily with you guys last week so thank you so much for watching and the josh mccuga show on youtube and of course you guys can follow me on facebook and on twitter just at john campia that'll do it for us guys make sure you subscribe to our youtube channel here keeping you up to date on everything going on over here at collider video that'll do it for us guys follow me on facebook and twitter at john campia that'll do it thanks a lot for joining us and we'll see you tomorrow